just a, an introduction to Jack. He's a, a senior inspector with the Department of Agriculture and Food and the Marine for <coughs> Nitrates, Biodiversity uh, and Engineering Division. The division is responsible for the development of sustainable agriculture and rural development through the implementation of legislation relating to the nitrates and environmental. Jack is also responsible for the provision of specialist and technical expertise around policies and legislation in relation to programs such as soil, water, biodiversity and air. So look, um, without further ado, I'll, I'll uh, invite uh, Jack to, to come on to the webinar and uh, he can give you his presentation. So welcome, Jack. Thanks very much, TJ. Good evening, everybody. I just want to get the slides set up here and then we get going. So what I'm going to do tonight is give you uh, kind of the department perspective on the environment. You've probably heard a lot about the nitrates review and the nitrates derogation. And there's been an awful lot of talk about agriculture and the environment building up over the last couple of months, uh, over the last couple of years even. And sometimes it can be seen as a negative. I think we should see it as an opportunity, that it's something there that we're probably among the best in the world at. There are some things a bit out of kilter that we need to correct, and I'll go through those. But we have an opportunity now to correct them ourselves. Like we don't need anybody else coming in to tell us what to do. We know we're selling an awful lot of food abroad. Last year we sold about 13 billion worth of product abroad, food, 5 billion I think of dairy product. And we want to keep selling that. There's a huge market in the EU, about 420 or 30 million, even after Brexit. And that's a really valuable market. And we want to be seen as a premium product. Just to start the presentation, I'd like to ask you to say, just to, like when TJ introduces me, uh, there's a lot of stuff there around what I do and all. But just leave your mind open for the next 20 or 25 minutes. Like we're going to cross some stuff that you might disagree with me on, but just... This is what um, an economist, some people say John Maynard Keynes said it, others say this man said it, but when events change, I change my mind. What do you do? So there's new evidence coming all the time. Now that applies to you, it applies to me too. So if there's something you show me or that research shows that we should change on, fair enough. But just because you did something this way all your life or your father did it, it doesn't mean that you continue to do it. Like 30 years ago, you would probably got a grant to put a silage bit beside a drain or a stream, because you'd get rid of the effluent off it. And we know that's no longer acceptable. There are some things there that we've lost that we could still be doing more about, possibly things like soil. We might be top notch on animal health that we could be. Fertilizer, an understanding of fertilizer and what we do. But all I'm asking is that just don't give up on me straight away. I'll only be about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. So when you read about Ireland, if you were abroad or if when we were allowed to fly, if you were going on Aer Lingus or Ryanair coming into Ireland, you'd see all the advertising around our environment and what we're doing and so on. And we have a good story from that point of view. Like we'd be in the top third, I'd say, in Europe for water. We have about 600,000 kilometres of hedgerow in Ireland. We have a very picturesque landscape. And the more diverse a landscape we can have, the better for biodiversity. I don't know if you, any of you read the Farmer's Journal, but last week Andy Doyle, the tillage editor, had an article and he said that the area of tillage in Ireland has halved in the last 40 years. Now that's not good from the idea of native grain going into animals' diet, but also it's not good for biodiversity because a lot of birds live in stubbles over winter and so on. We're being challenged on this good story in the last couple of weeks, sorry, a couple of months. It's been called greenwashing. I'll show you some headlines in a minute that were in the paper there around November. Uh, last November, the EPA published the State of the Environment Report, which is basically a scorecard for the Irish environment. And agriculture is a central part of that. Like 65% of the land area of Ireland is agriculture or used for agriculture. So everything you do as farmers has a major impact on that. When you spread your fertilizer, when you cut the grass, when you cut the silage and so on. The, what your animals are doing out on the field, the way you cut your hedges. Like a simple little thing like leaving two or three foot on top of the hedgerow makes a difference for biodiversity. So like I say, there's two sides to this. We have a very picturesque country, but are we telling the truth around what's happening in the environment? So this is a picture from Wexford there last week. We had snow on the ground, but somebody was stuck and they had to get out with slurry. Now maybe it's soil and water because it doesn't actually look as thick as slurry. But 
matter what you're going to say to me afterwards about calendar farming, this is not right. There's a huge problem around slurry storage capacity. There says enough. It comes up every year around close period, calendar farming, farming by dates, it's all wrong. But there's no one spreading urea in the middle of December or going out with 10, 10, 20. But there are people doing this. And this year, because December might have been a bit drier around here anyway, there seemed to be more at it than ever before. The nitrates review is taking place this year, and this is going to be a major focus. Some people suggest we should do a blitz on dairy farmers, on dairy farmers that have expanded in the past four or five years. Because often, I'm not saying they're the only ones, but often their facilities haven't kept pace with the expansion. And this is a real problem. This is not from six years ago. It's not some environmental crank somewhere. I know the area and I took the photo and the person that did it would be considered an excellent farmer. It is an excellent farmer. But here they are putting out, you can see there the slope to the right down to the sea, down to the river, that's going to the sea. When that thaws out, there's going to be huge loss. 50% of nutrient loss from agriculture occurs between October, November, December. Maybe the close period should be extended and people should be asked, like, by rights, if you have 16 week storage, you should get from the middle of October up till about the start of February before you have to spread slurry. But that doesn't happen. There's a contractor down the road from me and he's excellent and he has an umbilical system. And he says it's the best machine he ever bought. He bought it about three years ago when we had a big snow. And he used to have the loader in front of it clearing the way. He was getting paid by the council for that. And then the lads coming with the umbilical system behind him because people were stuck and they couldn't get out. If you take nothing else away from tonight, this idea of spreading slurry over the winter, dumping it really, that just cannot continue. And if we can't do it voluntarily with the regulation we'll have, we'll have to increase the number of inspections. These are all headlines that were in the paper there last November. Chagas produced a report um, with Cork Institute of Technology saying that Irish dairy farmers are the most profitable across Europe. At the same time, the farm to fork, the European Green Deal has been released and Chagas did an analysis of that for the department and said, if you have to cut fertilizer use, it could cut dairy profits by 10%. Now, fertilizer use is going to be cut. Nitrogen use is going to be cut, but there are ways and methods for you to deal with it. Like nitrogen efficiency was a big focus of the virtual dairy seminar that Chagas had. And there are things like clover, low emission slurry spreading, using less crude protein in the diet getting your slurry out at the right time of year, multi-species grasslands, all these things help make better use of nitrogen. Having your soil in balance, having the phosphorus and potassium right, having your pH right, all these things, because there's no doubt, like fertilizer use is going to be restricted in the future. It's the amount of it that will have to be sorted out. At the moment, the department are exploring the idea of a chemical fertilizer register from the 1st of January next year. So that if you go into the co-op and buy a pallet of fertilizer, 10, 10, 20, or can, or protected urea, or whatever you buy, it'll automatically link up with a system in the department. Because we know that we have limits and that if people, if everybody in Ireland complied with those limits, we wouldn't have the problems that we have. <clears throat> there was an article in The Guardian that compared or talked about Irish agriculture as being industrial. When I think of industrial farming, I used to think of Holland and Denmark and these places where you have a confined system. We don't want that image bandied about about Ireland. I don't think it's true. But that, that article was read by between 15 and 20 million people who are all your target. They're your customers because they're buying your product. And then the EPA came out there at the end of November and said that there's greenwashing going on, that we're talking a great game. And by talking, I mean us in the agricultural sector and we, it's you, me, the people here from the co-ops, the researchers, the advisors, but we're not telling the truth. We're making all these claims. We're saying that we're only at the same herd size as we were 20 years ago, which is right. But I'll show you in a minute where the herd actually is now. There are, there are a huge amount of good things in agriculture, but we also need to own this problem ourselves and start making changes that are going to have an impact on the environment. Like the structure in Ireland is that 12% of farmers have about 60% of the output. We talk about 137,000 farmers because 137,000 people apply for basic payment. But I don't know should they all be classified as farmers because 
Then we say, look, the average basic payment is less than 10,000. A huge amount of farmers can't make a viable income from farming. So a third of farmers are considered to be viable. And that means that they make on non-capital investments, they make a return of more than 18,000 plus 5% per year. Another third are considered to be, they're say viable because they have an off-farm income or, or their spouse has an off-farm income. And then there's a third that just are not viable. They're vulnerable. But talking about all these people as farmers is not true. For example, dairy farmers say there's 16 or 17,000, depending on when you do the numbers, use 50% of fertilizer in Ireland. So that's a huge amount of pressure on the land area that dairy have. And dairy, I think, makes up about 25% of the land dairy of Ireland. And there's a significant amount of stock on dairy farms. And what's happening, I'll show you in a minute, is that large farms are getting larger and small farms are getting smaller. There's nothing wrong with that, you may say, except that it's placing, if you have a grazing platform at a very high stocking rate, when a dairy cow excretes urine, it can be at a rate of 1,000 kilos per hectare, equivalent in nitrogen. And that's a huge amount of pressure. And then we have parts, <coughs> sorry, we have parts of the country where land is nearly abandoned. And that's not what's wanted either. We want to maintain biodiversity across Ireland. We want viable your rural economies, but we want to protect the environment as well. So if you look at this figure here, these 133,000 farmers on this with some stock or 30,000 of no stock. So that's 100, say 100,000 farmers with stock. 9% of the farmers in 2018 on 14% of the area had 33% of the livestock. So if somebody says to you, we have the same amount of cattle now as we had 20 or 30 years ago, that's right. But now they've moved to the south and southeast of the country. And these areas that are in orange there in the right hand corner at the bottom of the map, the south and southwest of the country, this is where the intensification is occurring. This is where the expansion is occurring. Between Cork and Tipperary and Kilkenny, that's where 50% of the expansion took place in the last four or five years. There are more cows now in Cork than there are in the six counties of Northern Ireland. And these areas that are orange, the red dots that are underneath them, are where we have the derogation farmers. And some of you might be derogation farms. So you know what that means. It lets you keep more than the two cows per hectare. It lets you go up to nearly three cows and use more nitrogen and phosphorus. But when you look at the location of these and link them up with water quality, there's something going wrong. And that's not to say that the rest of the country is perfect. There are problems with phosphorus and sediment loss from soil erosion in the West. So every farmer has something to do or can contribute towards the environment. But it is interesting to see this intensification. And a small number of farmers use a large amount of fertilizer and control large amounts of stock. Now, it always comes out, people say, what about the septic tanks? What about the treatment, the wastewater treatment plants in towns and that's for, and cities? And that's very true. And for phosphorus, it's about the same. You know, the amount of phosphorus from septic tanks and treatment plants and so on, it's about the same. But for nitrogen, it's about 10 times. You know, if you look at the green there, it's agriculture around the country. And these are figures from the EPA from 2014 and they're updating them at the minute. And what the EPA are saying to us is that by June or July of this year, they will have figured out how much of a nitrogen reduction is needed in each catchment in the water and then work that back to the land. And when we go to negotiate with the commission around our nitrates derogation, they'll be asking us what's happening here in Ireland, right? You've had significant expansion there since the end of quota. That was anticipated and there's a food demand, but are you protecting the environment? What is your water quality doing? And although we're in the top third in Europe, we have a declining trend. And that's a real problem. So 2018, we could go back over a couple of years. 2018, we had a drought. A lot of people put out nitrogen there in the summer. We didn't know what to do. That was mineralized later on when we got rain and we got excess nitrogen in the water. But that was just one year. Like if you go back over four or five years, the trend is downward. And what are we doing now about it? Well, I tell you, if you're spreading slurry there in November or December, you're definitely not helping. If you're putting out urea because your neighbor is, you're not helping. If you're not measuring grass, you're doing harm. 
Because if you're not measuring and controlling and know what you're doing, you can't control it. And what you should be doing now is looking forward and seeing where you're going to put your slurry, putting your grass up on pasture base and so on, planning for your silage. Are you going to put out 100 units of nitrogen per acre this year on silage and maybe have problem with nitrates in it? Or could you cut back 20 units per acre on silage? Because if you do, that's about two thirds of your farm. And then throughout the year, you've saved 20 units of nitrogen on about two thirds of your farm, which equates to about 16 units per acre over the whole farm. And then on every round of nitrogen, if you could save a couple of units, it wouldn't be long before you'd be saving the equivalent of a bag of can. And that's the way we need to start to think because the cut is coming next year. So you may as well get ready for it this year. If you see over the last couple of years, you're making an awful lot of excess silage because you have too much growth. Have you changed practice then? Like, are you growing too much grass in the middle of the year when you have a surplus anyway? I understand we ha like nobody wants to have a fodder crisis or anything like that. But if you're, like, if you go on to Dundeal today, down here anyway, you'd get silage for 20 euro a bale. It just doesn't make sense to grow grass, make silage, pay a contractor to come in and sell it at 20 euro a bale. You can't do it and make money out of it. So it's nearly a waste product. This grass that's grown at the wrong time of year is something to be gotten rid of. We had a nitrates review back in 2019 and 2020 because of expansion and more measures were brought in for derogation farms. And these include things like compulsory use of low emission slurry, sorry, low emission slurry spreading equipment, like using a trailing shoe or a dribble bar because it prevents ammonia losses. Um, if you're a derogation farmer and there are about 7,000 in the country, you must pick a measure from the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. One measure on your farm. It's either only side cutting a hedgerow or leaving a stock every 100 metres or so. So it should have minimal impact on you as a farmer, but it can make a huge difference. Like we have brilliant farmers in Ireland growing grass and so on. And some people think that we have to cut the hedges down into grass banks to be seen as being neat and be tidy. You know, we, we just want everything tight. But there's no room there then for anything else to do anything. There's no shelter for animals. There's very little as regards the disease barrier. It's very poor as regards holding water, which is good for preventing floods. And it's virtually useless for biodiversity. Everything can grow something. So there will be some biodiversity in a grassy bank. But surely we could leave some room. Now, people will say, right, but if I leave habitats grow on my farm, the department will come along and penalise me. We won't penalise you if you have a, a hedgerow that's not managed within an inch of its life. The department have raised it. The new cap has been negotiated at the minute. And the department have raised several fragments that we've had, we've had this year over the last 12 months, I think. They've all raised the issue of the eligible hectare in the negotiations of the cap and the problem that farmers are actually taking out habitats because when they're inspected by the department, that land could be declared ineligible. So that problem is well known, it's been flagged and hopefully in the next regulation, it'll be better dealt with. The use of clover, if you're reseeding, clover offers you the opportunity to save about 80 kilos per hectare of nitrogen between 80 and 100. So three bags of can an acre nearly, if you're talking about 100 kilos per hectare, it's the same as three bags of can or nearly two bags of urea. Now, you know the cost of that better than me. Some people say there's issues around the management of clover, but Deirdre Hennessy in Moor Park gave a talk there lately. They're using it successfully. They're actually getting more milk solids off the plots where there's clover. And you're reducing chemical fertilizer. Derogation farmers are being asked to measure grass and to use either pasture base or any other system where you're going to record it online. And the reason there is so that you can plan and you can apply the fertilizer in accordance with the crop needs, because grass is a crop. Sometimes we just think a crop is barley or oats or wheat or something, but grass is a crop. It just happens to grow very well in Ireland. But this idea that I suppose in a couple of weeks or maybe even now you'll see people talking about the target to get fertilizer out by a date in April. But what has that got to do with actual grass growth? Like grass is not going to grow till it's five degrees. Or if your land is not trafficable enough, or if there are wet spots on the farm. These are all things, simple things you can do. Take care, 
only put it out as it's needed. And you know your land better than me or anybody else. And only apply it where it's going to be effective. The 85 kilo figure for the dairy cow, the excretion figure has gone up to 89 kilos. And that might change again. That's based on milk yield. And the 85 kilos was based on a cow yielding 4,600 litres. And the average cow now is around 5,500. But if milk yield keeps increasing, that figure will change again. So if you're planning ahead and thinking whether you're in or out of a derogation, this year plan on the 89 because it's there in regulation. And for the future, imagine where would you be if that figure goes up to 92, 93? Because if milk yield keeps going up, well, that, be, that will be revised as well. I don't know how much lime costs down by you. For me, I'm in Wexford here. It's about 22 euro a tonne to get lime delivered and spread. And lime gives an economic return of seven to one, according to Chagas. So if you spend a thousand euro on lime this year, over the next four years, it'll feed you back 7,000 because you'll have to, you'll have more grass growth. You'll be able to reduce the amount of meal you feed and the fertilizers that you apply will be used more efficiently. So for derogation farmers and those over 170 that export slurry, use of lime is compulsory. This year, there's another review of the, of the nitrates and the derogation taking place. And the department and Chagas and the EPA and Department of Housing have an expert group there. There was an open or a consultation there from the middle of December up until the middle of January, and 90 submissions were received from farming organizations, from environmental groups, from individuals and so on. All these will be assessed and read and the ideas from them brought forward. And then there'll be another public, public consultation period in April or May. And then both departments will agree what should happen for the future. Now, some people are saying already, if the regulation that was there was implemented properly, we wouldn't have such issues. So things around slurry storage, like we have this regulation now for 15 years, and you know yourself whether or not you have enough slurry storage. But a lot of farmers mustn't have, because if they did, you wouldn't be seeing the picture that I showed you and the amount of slurry that was spread there in December. And then we get this other thing of people saying, well, it's the open period now. It's really stupid and it's raining. But what the regulation says is that you definitely can't spread slurry from the middle of October up till the 12th or the end of January, depending on where you are. And then you should only spread it when soil and weather conditions are suitable. And really, you need a buffer. And the whole thing around slurry storage is going to be examined over this year. Are the closed periods long enough? If there's not enough slurry storage on farms, what are we going to do about it? Do we need longer slurry storage, mandatory slurry storage on farms? How are we going to implement what we have there already? We haven't touched on biodiversity much, but if biodiversity is wrong, everything else is wrong. According to research that the EU commissioned and have published and have cited, almost 50% of global domestic product comes from biodiversity. Like if you look at the hedge in the slide, sorry, in the top of the picture on the left-hand side, that hedge is a disease barrier. Some people might look at it and think it's way overgrown. It's a disease barrier. It'll prevent water coming in. It'll prevent stock touching each other. It'll give the animals shelter. There's a huge value to it. Now to be fantastic, if you could be paid for that, if the consumer, if your milk went in somewhere, and if you had more biodiversity on your farm, well, you get an extra cent per litre. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen here in Ireland. Ideally, that's what you'd like to see. Like the consumer says they want to see more biodiversity, but at the minute they're not paying for it. But hopefully in the future, that is something you'll be paid for. So that if you have better hedgerows, better management, cleaner water, you will be paid for it. What you're seeing down below there is the European Green Deal. And this is what we're working towards. And there's very ambitious climate targets. There's targets there to reduce nutrient loss by, to water by 50% by 2030, which will probably result in a 20% reduction in fertilizers. Now, that's probably, it may take more in some places, less in others. But you need to understand that when you see figures for the amount of nitrogen that needs to be taken out of the system to meet climate targets, that won't be good enough for water because somebody in Mayo not spreading fertilizer will have no impact, impact on water quality in West Cork. Like there are local hotspots within Ireland where water quality is poor. And these areas might have to be treated slightly differently to others. Blanket regulations have taken us so far, but if we want to make further gains and we do and we need to, 
Well, then there may need to be specific targeted measures. At the bottom on the right hand side there is just a hand of soil. A third of the biodiversity on Earth, on Earth is in our soil. A teaspoon of soil contains about a billion different microorganisms. And we don't know enough about soil. I think since the introduction and the use, the really massive use of nitrogen, phosphorus, chemicals and so on, we've moved away from proper soil management. We damage our soils with machinery. We don't fertilize it properly. We put out nitrogen because we see a quick response. We have some fantastic farmers out there that do a brilliant job on soil. If you went into your field tomorrow with a spade and dug up a sod and dropped that sod on the ground, does it stay together like a lump of concrete? Or are there roots going down through it so that it crumbles? Now, obviously, soil differs across the country. It even differs in fields. But you need to be getting everything you can out of that soil because we're asking it to filter water, grow crops, store nutrients, sequester carbon. There's so much going on there. And we put a lot of pressure on it. We do a lot of good things around it, but at a bare minimum, we should be getting the pH right. You should be soil sampling. Some, some like it's mandatory if you're in a derogation that you soil sample every four years. But all the research from Tagus shows that about two thirds of farmers were taking the soil sample and putting it in a drawer. And it was only there for the sake of a regulation. That's a waste of your money. Like you're going to take this sample anyway, you might as well get value from it. If your phosphorus is wrong and your potassium is wrong, your nitrogen can't work. If your pH is wrong, you're only going to get about 50% efficiency. 50% of the nitrogen you go out will go to work. The rest is a waste. <coughs> and on average on dairy farms, on farms, dairy farms in Ireland, nitrogen use efficiency is in the low 20%. And the target is to get it up to about 34 or 35%. So there's huge gains can be made there. This chart here is called Mulder's chart. And I've been talking about, and you commonly hear talk about phosphorus, potassium, and so on, lime. But what about all the other elements that are there? Things like zinc, boron, manganese, magnesium. Because if you have too much copper, for example, it'll lock up iron. Iron locks up phosphorus. So are you doing a nutrient analysis, a full nutrient analysis on your soil or on your grass, and seeing what's actually happening there? This is an area we need to do much more around. The people that are selling you fertilizer. We need to do much more around this because when we talk about a cotton fertilizer, it still says we want to balance soil fertility. So what you want to do is get more value out of the nitrogen that you're applying, probably apply more phosphorus and potassium and cater more for these elements here. But everybody needs to do more about that. We need to do more about it from a policy point of view. Fertilizer suppliers need to be talking about it and you as farmers need to know what's in your soil. You'll have heard a lot about the green architecture and cap. And what's happening really is that the bar, you're all familiar with cross compliance. And when they talk now about conditionality, what conditionality means really is cross compliance that's been brought up a little bit. So the big change was proposed that there be compulsory nutrient management planning. At the moment, that's not agreed. <laughs> There's negotiations ongoing at the moment between the Commission and the Parliament. And what's going to come out of that? And the MEPs, these trilogues they're called. We do know that there's more expectations. For the first time ever, part of your basic payment will be taken away and you'll only get it back if you come into an eco scheme. And an eco scheme will be an annual measure to deliver something to the environment. And it'll have to be simple and it'll have to deliver something because the department will have to administer it, inspect it <coughs> and pay for it all within 12 months. And it'll have to be something that will actually cause change on farms. But you should understand that you're all familiar with convergence. This is going to take, the figure isn't decided yet, but if we say 20%, it'll take a 20% cut off every farmer in Ireland. It'll put it into a pot called eco schemes and then you'll do something to get it back but you're probably not going to get back all the money you put in. So how else are you going to get the money back? What are you going to do to get the money back? You have an opportunity to come into an agri-environmental measure. Dairy farmers probably haven't come in in the past as much as we'd like them to. That's been looked at really closely because dairy farmers have a huge amount to offer. 
from the view of the environment around biodiversity, water, climate change. And there will be measures there. Hopefully schemes will be designed that you can engage with and that will make a difference to the environment. <clears throat> if we were speaking in Holland tonight, they have a scheme called Top Swivel. Now, I'm, I can't speak Dutch, but Top Swivel or Top Swivel, whereby you'd get a lower interest loan from Rabobank if you have more biodiversity on your farm and Friesland Campina would pay you extra two cent per kilo of milk solids for the biodiversity on your farm. And we got a, an email from a colleague in Holland last week, and I don't know whether he added an odd by accident, but he said to the average 75 hectare farm with 130 cows in Holland, this scheme is worth about 15,000 euro for biodiversity. So that's real support from industry for causing change on farms. And there's tremendous opportunity in Ireland, you'd hope, for the same thing. Because there isn't enough money in CAP to do everything that people wanted to do. We wanted to protect water, change biodiversity stats, reduce climate change. So it needs to come from industry as well. And we also definitely need the consumer to pay more. So like if we went into, if we were allowed to, if we went into a health food shop, you'd see almonds, juice, they call it milk, coming in from where? California or somewhere, soya coming from Brazil. The, never mind the harm in the traveling, the cost of getting it here, but the deforestation that's taking place there and so on. It's really important that Irish milk is seen and you are seen as stewards protecting the environment and are acknowledged for that and paid for that and improve on what we're doing already. And just this, my second last slide, animal numbers are still going up. Fertilizer is still going up, both about two or three percent. Greenhouse gas emissions and ammonia emissions, agriculture is responsible for about 99 percent of ammonia emissions. Unfortunately, biodiversity and water quality are going in the wrong direction. But these are things we can control. Like any of you that went to the open day in Moor Park there two years ago, the Dairy Day, the first four boards there were all about you increasing the efficiency of use of nitrogen through clover, low emission slurry, managing grass, measuring grass. Some people are trialing multi-species grassland now, they're finding it working very well. We're not doing enough around soil health at all and getting the soil functioning properly. And lastly there, I don't know if it's something you think about, is the social license. So there it came up about two years ago about calves or last year, like the calf welfare scheme was introduced. But people say, look, it's not acceptable. Animal welfare is very important. Again, there isn't money coming back for the consumer, but it is expected that animals are going to be treated right, and the majority of farmers are, and that they're going to be healthy, and that they'll be treated well, and that issues like lameness and so on will be dealt with. Like an animal that's lame is 5 to 10% more inefficient than a healthy animal. Finally then, where we want to get to, and there's a lot of words on this slide, but don't mind it, but really what it's saying is you want to get to a happy balance, where farmers are getting the same message from everybody. So some people are coming out to you saying buy more fertilizer, feed more meal. Then you listen to someone like me that's saying you have to cut back fertilizer. The co-op are buying the milk, whatever milk you produce, the co-op will buy it. Consumer won't pay you extra. But things are changing. The way it's going to change is if you change it. You on your farm. I'm not going to visit you. The department visits one in a hundred farms every year. You need to believe you're doing the right thing. You need to look after yourself as well. I haven't talked about health and safety here at all. As a farmer, you're seven times more likely to be killed, to die. You're about nine times more likely to be killed on a farm. The level of farm accidents is huge, it's shocking, it hasn't come down. Farmers are a really vulnerable group. One of the things, the questions you're, I, I'm going to be asked at some stage, what should we do about nitrogen? To me, like, get yourself healthy first and then look after the environment. Go out for a walk every now and again, look after your family, that's the most important thing. Then think about the environment. There are three different ways of going at it, incentives through cap, what the consumer pays you, and then hopefully we'll get money in for biodiversity and for water quality. But all these things have to work together. And then hopefully we'll cause change. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. That's super stuff. Um, look, we, I, there's a few questions have rolled in, and I just say to anybody else that if they want to ask any questions, there is a, a Q&A um, function there as well in, um, in your Zoom. But just, just, I suppose, the first question, uh, Jack, there uh, on, on the slides that you had at the very beginning with the slurry. I mean, at, at the moment, with, with TAMS grants, and I suppose you're well aware, and, and that it's, it's um, 
to to get a TAMS grant, you have to be fully, you have to have the full story storage capacity. Like, is that not a, a bit of a contradiction? Like, is it, would it, could there be any movement in that in the future just to try and help people to have the, the story storage for the amount of stock that they have? I suppose, TJ, you see, when, the, when any change comes in, you have a year to grant aid then. So, like, you know the way the low emission equipment became compulsory for derogation farms? You only have a year to grant aid. So, and that's in the regulation. Like, we can't go back to the Commission now in 2020 and say, look at these laws we brought in there in 2005 and six. We don't have enough slurry storage capacity. But you can think about it yourself. Like, I mean, if, you, if you're planning, say, to get TAMs, the way it's calculated is on the last winter. So if you have sheds on your farm where you could be using straw bedding, you'll get credit for that. If you could rent a tank somewhere, if it was available or slurry storage, you'll get credit for that. Or if you could get the followers off your farm just for the winter, you'd get credit for that. I mean, it takes planning and it's a bit of hassle, but there are still ways to get the TAMS grant because there is no way. If I could and if the department could, it's the most valuable thing that can be done. Slurry storage, building slurry tanks. And unfortunately, it can't be granted. On the flip side, a couple of my neighbours were telling me they're going to go out to 20 weeks storage. Here in Wexford, you only have to have 16 weeks. And when you ask them why, they say, well, look, to be honest, it takes the stress out of it. There's no hassle. I know it's a cost and it's a major investment, but it just takes the stress out of it. I'm not worried about getting the tanks empty, taking a chance in December or get them out on the 16th of January. I can spread it when I want to and I'll get most value out of it. And that just takes the regulation out of it altogether. Like, if people want, we could go back to Brussels and say, look at, we want to be able to spread slurry over the winter. And they'll say, right, well, put in enough storage there so that, say for six months, for example, and then you can spread it when you want. But there is no way the slurry close period thing is going to change. And if anything, it might extend. So people should be planning along those lines and getting ready for it. Okay. Um, the, the, the derogation, I mean, at this point in time, I mean, will the derogation continue or is there, is there questions around it or, or will it be the conditions around the future derogation? I mean, how do you see that panning out in the year or so? We're meeting the Commission for the first time uh, negotiate this derogation on the 9th of February. And the first presentation will be all around water quality. That's what they're interested in. And then depending on how that goes, you move on to agriculture. So what I think we've already introduced measures in the last year for derogation farmers that probably need to be given time to work, plus more measures this year for those that export slurry. What's going to happen with the derogation? There was a CAP strategic plan published there before Christmas recommending what we should do in CAP. And it says that there are hot spots for water quality in Ireland where you'll need to take more measures. So it's likely we will be reducing nitrogen. Nitrogen rates will be reduced next year. There may be other measures. And then the other thing that will be looked at is in Holland, for example, where they have very clear like some sands, some soils, as far as I understand, you can define them as <coughs> sand and others mineral, and they have reduced stocking rates there. That'll be considered. But this, like the next six months are going to tell all this, but there's definitely change coming. Okay. Um, rough ground um, and biodiversity, if, if, if a person uh, in, in improves their biodiversity or increase their biodiversity, could that come against them later? And, and even as it stands, and I, I know you, you mentioned it during the presentation as well, that, um, you know, for, for rough ground, I suppose, in the past, the department would have been kind of sending out letters to people to um, clean up their rough ground, and, and it kind of flies against the face of the whole biodiversity um, soundings that, that's going on there at the moment. So, like, could, how, how do you see that changing? I, 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 do you remember reps, TJ? I remember a photo on yeah. the front of the Farmer's Journal, a fellow with a high mac getting ready for reps, and that was the picture. And Sorry, all, you know, all that has to change. Like, I mean, the regulation will be out hopefully next year. It'll be agreed. And hopefully that will change. That we will be, um, that land, there won't be a problem around that land because it is an issue. I accept it is an issue and it needs to change. Sorry, Jay, I, I lost you there for a minute, I think. Oh, sorry. Yeah, TJ, that is an issue that needs to change. But we hope under the next regulation, that there won't be problems there. But just when you say rough grazing, there are some farmers that are, um, there are some farmers that are claiming commonage or what was termed rough grazing to dilute their stocking rate. And that's another area, like there used to be about 300 farmers in the derogation that were using derogation land as well. Like 
we know that's not true and you know it's not true and the farmers themselves know it's not true. And all that is placing extra pressure on the Greenland. All these things are going to be tidied up over the next year. But I really hope what you're talking about here in the eligible hectare, we will come to a place where it's not a problem for us to have biodiversity on a farm. And like for people that currently have a, a, a good level of biodiversity that there's not, um, that's not going to be held against them. If, if we say, for instance, that you had to increase your biodiversity or had to have a minimum biodiversity holding or, or hedgerows on a farm that um, it's not, it's not what you have now is not going to be. Uh, no, not at all. Like I'm farming a little bit myself and going to plant a hedge in February for shelter for stock. I'm not waiting for two years time to see what happens. Okay. Now, everybody is different, but the target is to have 10% by 2030. If you have it now, you can be paid in the future for the way you manage it. You know, like every habitat could be managed better. Like the key thing with biodiversity is to protect what we have, improve what we have, and then create more. We've been brilliant in environmental schemes about planting new hedgerows and trees and all, but really we need to be looking after what we have and protecting it. So, no, that won't be an issue. Um, just another one for, for, for your crystal ball, if you have it near you. Um, I, I mean, with the with the with the um, I suppose the, the the changes with the climate action plan. Um, different farmers have different uh, systems. There's there's high input systems and low input systems and high output systems and all all all, all, talk, all, all types of systems, all types of cows. Um, and over the next ten years, I mean, where do you see like what what system do you see um, average dairy farmers in, in by 2030 after with, with the redu reduction in, in, in nitrogen and, and, and to, to help with efficiency with greenhouse gas. Um, that's a pretty low question. But. Uh, it'll be lower nitrogen anyway, and it doesn't matter whether you're using protected urea or can or ordinary urea, it'll be lower nitrogen. Hopefully the soil will be working better. Like Chagas are promoting one system, you're all familiar with it, um, there's research going on in UCD about feeding a higher level of lines. Uh, sorry, there's research going on in UCD about feeding a higher level of concentrates, which is not what we want either. Like, both of those have their merits and both have to be looked at. I suppose it'll depend on, the whole thing depends on the soil, TJ, and what the soil can take. Like, we know that some soil types at three cows a hectare with 250 kilos of nitrogen are okay. We know that others with two cows and 200 kilos of nitrogen are weeping like a sieve. And that's very detailed information that we need to get. What we do know is that in June of this year, the EPA will be giving us maps that show critical source areas. So there'll be areas on each farm where losses are occurring or where are most vulnerable. And farmers will have to take special care there. I think people know this already. There are areas where you wouldn't get into graze as quick or you wouldn't travel with a tanker as early in the year. And they're the really vulnerable areas. It's hard to know for the future. I do know... Irish milk is well got, Irish product is well got, we're exporting so much of it, who knows what's going to happen now with Brexit, but we will be more aware of the environment. The key thing, and hopefully in the next year there'll be a platform launched that'll let, farm, let, let business support biodiversity, is to get money flowing in, to add value to what we're doing. So you're not just being paid for food, you're being paid, you produce, you're being paid for the environmental good you're doing on the farm as well. Okay. Um Super. Look, I just one, one, one more quick one, so because look, I'm unconscious of time and, and to move on as well to, to, to Jason. Um, could the 250 kilos uh, per hectare derogation reduce? And if so, what would the likely figure be? It could easily reduce. Every four years you have to reapply for it, so it's not a given. Like it's not a rollover, it's a brand new derogation. Uh, the Germans lost their derogation a couple of years ago because their water quality is very, very poor. The Dutch have, I think it's 250 and 220. I think the Danes have 230. So yes, it could, but I don't know. Like when we look at Chagask research, it's all dependent on the soil type, but it is identified already. <clears throat> if you look at the EPA water quality maps, there are areas there where water quality is deteriorating all the time and nitrogen will have to reduce. If we can take, if we can show we're going to reduce chemical fertilizer, well, maybe we can do more around stock, but it is, I, I, I genuinely can't answer it, but it is definitely, the 250 can definitely come down. Okay, Thank, th thanks, thanks Jack, super stuff. Um, and to look if anybody has any more questions, maybe we might have time for just a, a few at the end as well, but look, um, I'm just conscious of time. Jack, just, uh, I suppose it, there, there was a few more questions kind of um, came Go in. Yeah. All right, yeah, just on, on um, 
I suppose it's just a comment there about water quality, allowing water course to, 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 to grass up uh, and trap nutrients that it, it causes problems, I suppose, with, with drainage, it, it, depending on the type of land. It, um, and I suppose especially a lot of the West Cork type land that has drains and, and whatnot, look, and there's a lot of talk as well about re wetting and stuff like that, um, which is it's scary talk, I suppose, by farmers that would probably reclaimed land and, and drained land over a long period of time, I suppose. The, the generation that are there now, the generation that were there before them, but look, um, it, have you any kind of thoughts on, yeah. on, on, on there's what a, that? There's a drainage manual there that Chagas have, you know, for heavy land, TJ, and I remember in the old reps, it used to be a thing that you'd see, you'd, you'd clean one side of the drain, say, this year, and then leave it and clean the other side next year. You know that there'd be something there, and then any spoil that you take out of it should be taken well away from the drain because if that sediment gets back in, it gets phosphorus in, you know? So there's a balance to be struck. You know, you still want to keep farming. I suppose the simple thing to do if you are cleaning a drain, get a square bale of straw, it's not that dear, and put it into it as a sediment strap or a round bale. You know, people do simple things, even like a bag, you know, a meal bag held up that'll block, you know, uh, you, do you know what I mean? Like um, on a frame in it, so you're not losing all the silt. You know, that's the really important thing. The re-wetting there, we're losing an awful lot of carbon from our drain grassland in Ireland. But really, the re-wetting is around peat soils. You know, that's that's the target there. And I'd say, looking at Chagas figures, 60 to 70% of drains aren't working properly anyway. I remember talking to a colleague about that. So it might actually impact on farmers too much, you know. And 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 putting in that that um, uh, straw bale or, 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 or a bag or something, that's a temporary measure, obviously, just while you're cleaning out the drains, is it just, yeah. Yeah, to... yeah, you'd see it yourself, like around me, like say, if we ploughed there and there's heavy rain, you know the way the water in the river or the stream changes colour? Like it's the same thing in the drain. While the drain, if you're cleaning it, is brown because of the soil, well, leave something in it to block it because then you're stopping it going, you know, and you can take that out or... You'll see it yourself that it's after settling down. But whatever you do will help. Because if you don't put anything at all in, that phosphorus, the sediment in it is going to carry phosphorus. And the sediment itself does awful harm. And down your way, I'm not sure if it's over you or what part of Cork it's in. You know the pearl mussel, you've probably have come across it. Yeah. It's an indicator of real high quality water. And something like drainage has a really severe impact on it. So any of these simple things that you can do will make a difference. Okay, Thank thanks Jack. Um, Jack, have you any yeah. thoughts? I, I think food is too cheap. I think we have a complete lack of respect for food. The average householder spends less than half, about 14% of their household income every month now on food. 30 years ago, it was about 28%. We throw out a ton of food from every house each year. We have problems around obesity, reflected worldwide. At the moment, to me anyway, they're not paying for it. I'd love to see it paid for in the future. I think there's an expectation there. I think for funding of CAP, People expect a certain standard. You know, European taxpayers are paying for cap for the subsidies that are coming into the country, but it would be brilliant to see it in the in the future. Like, I think Ireland has about twelve percent of the infant milk market formula or infant yeah um, worldwide market, which is a huge, you know, a really premium product, very well respected, and it would be great. But I, I read Zoe Kavanagh, you know, she's head at National Dairy Council, and she said at the minute consumers aren't prepared to pay, but it is a space that. You would love to see Ireland stretch out further ahead of our competitors, so that there is a premium attached to it. Yeah, and like we we have we have a good story to tell. I mean, in, in comparison to our peers, and especially in other European countries and the US as well, in 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 the, the way the way the food is produced. But it's just about getting getting a buy into that. Um, it's probably the most important task in the next ten years, uh, as much as anything else. Just I suppose. We, 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 I'm just conscious of time as well, but just to, 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 to finish it up with, with, with a question for Jack. Um, uh, like a dairy farmer now, like what are the, the, the three biggest changes that a dairy farmer could make at this point in time um, to help with the environment? Like we say, just in the next, from tomorrow on, if they, if they, if they really wanted it, to help with, with the environment and I suppose to, 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 to prepare for all the all the, the, the changes that are going to be coming towards them. Like, what would you recommend, Jack, as the, the three changes that they could make from, from now on? Like, well, I suppose, and this might be a bit long-winded now, if I went to the bank, they'll stress test me at a higher interest rate. For the people that are listening here tonight, are you stress testing yourself for the environment? So invest in slurry storage, reduce the amount of nitrogen that you're using, 
they're key. And Chagas and private advisors will tell you all the ways to do that. But slurry storage is key. That's start with that. Reduce the amount of nitrogen that you're using. Use low emission equipment. Use clover, better timing, pasture base, animal breeding, genetics, all these things. And finally, and to me, most importantly, and I don't mean to be trite, look after yourself. You need to be in a good place mentally and physically. That's really important. A vulnerable group in society, which is terrible, but that'll be my thing. Okay, thanks, Jack. And look, that's I think that's very sound advice. Right, right, right at the at the end anyway. Look, and I just want to re really thank you, you, yourself, and Jason for 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 um for speaking here tonight. Look, it, it was very interesting and, and very relevant topics. And uh, also to to Seamus and Donald and Tim, I think they're they're there in the background as well tonight. Look, um, so look, and and just from my, from my own point of view, just to to tell everybody just to look after themselves as well. I think coming up to uh, calving season and, and springtime and everything else, and um, look, just best to look, I suppose. It would, would. Okay, no, I just want to thank thank, thank yourselves, um, uh, Jack and, and Jason, and, and also to Seamus and Dawn and Tim are there in the background. Um, look, I apologize for my own little technical problems if the Wi Fi is jumping in now, but look, and, and that's the other thing about the springtime is for everybody to look after themselves as well because. Um, you're nothing without your health. So look, look after you around calving time, machinery, and, and, and don't get COVID either because I mean, statistics from hospitals and, and, and ICUs and everything else are enough, but apparently, and I, I really don't want to get it, but apparently you'd be pretty sick. You could be pretty sick with it as well. And there's no point spending a couple of weeks in bed um, in, the, in the springtime when you should be uh, out and about in the fresh air. So look, best to look. And uh, hopefully we'll be back in some form of normality um, sooner rather than later. So look, good night and thanks. Thanks very much.